Hello, it says I'm live. I hope that everyone can hear me out there. We'll give them a moment to join. I needed a moment because of New Year technical glitches. I forgot how to plug in my camera, but that's how it goes sometimes. Let's see. And uh, Laura is in the background now, as she should be. Okay, I'm remembering how all this works. Um, if I'm a little windblown, sorry, it's uh, awfully cold out here. So um, uh, we've had uh, lots of difficulty with snow and all kinds of other fun things. So uh, good to see lots of people joining for the stream. If you're not sure where you are, you are in the Squirrel Squadron, which I'm going to explain. And uh, I'm Squirrel, your host for the Squirrel Squadron event on hiring technical people, even if you don't know how to write code yourself. So um, uh, uh, now there may be some of you, and I know at least a couple of you who signed up, uh, actually, uh, you're ringers. You actually know how to write code. There'll be plenty for you as well. But I'm going to focus today on helping people who don't write code themselves, who aren't technically minded, uh, who maybe don't know how to spell bit or byte. And uh, you're the folks that I'm going to be trying to help to navigate the world of uh, technical hiring. How do you get yourself a fantastic engineering team, even when you don't know how to write code? So if uh, that's what you came for, that's what you're here for. Um, please uh, comment in the chat. Tell me uh, who you are, why you're here, What's your major question uh, about this topic? And I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, let me just orient you a tiny bit more. Uh, the Squirrel Squadron is my community of uh, tech and non-tech people getting together. We got non-technical people as a focus today. Uh, we're often having topics that are relevant to both, as with this one. And uh, we do those in many different places. And sometimes people get confused. They think it's just the events, or it's just the weekly emails, or it's uh, just the forum. It's everything. It's all those together. Uh, so, for example, there's a forum in which uh, we're discussing all kinds of things. And I saw just a whole bunch of uh, very interesting comments a few moments ago from uh, several of our, our uh, folks. They were discussing uh, the idea of reification. That's a fancy word. Go look it up. Uh, it just means taking some complicated idea and making it into a, a series of steps that you can follow. Hi, Manesh. Uh, <laughs> Manesh knows how to spell bit. Excellent. Um, from uh, Atlanta. Very nice to see you joining us from there. Good morning. Um, the, uh, on the forum, they were also talking about influencers. And uh, it's amazing how Mr. Beast has like more followers than uh, uh, all the networks in uh, all the major Western countries combined. So um, uh, what, what, what does that mean for our society? What does that mean for uh, the technical um, uh, characteristics of the platforms like YouTube and TikTok on which these people operate. Um, and of course, we talk about artificial intelligence, but why you shouldn't use it to write anything, because I'm sick and tired of reading stuff that uh, computers write. Computers can't write yet. They're very useful at telling us things that we can write. So um, we're having a big discussion about that over on the Squirrel Squadron forum. All this stuff is free. You can sign up uh, at squirrelsquadron.com if you're interested. Um, there's also more events coming, so just like this one. Uh, we have a Zoom call next week for executives on performance testing. How do you make sure your software is fast? Um, you know, if people, it, it, every year it gets faster and faster, the expectation uh, for how quickly your app, your website should respond, and um, you lose money if it's not running as fast as it could. And uh, two weeks, one that might be interested, interesting to this audience is uh, asking technical questions. Uh, and I'm just going to have a, a bit to say about that in a moment. So uh, uh, glad to have all of you. Uh, please do comment in the chat in whatever um, uh, forum you're in. Uh, I can see those here. And my good friend, my community manager, Laura, is uh, helping keep an eye on that as well. So we'll pull out questions from there. Now, I have a bunch of material to talk about on this topic, and I'm happy to just keep yammering away on it. But I don't have an hour's worth. Uh, and it won't be as valuable unless you ask me questions. So Manesh, Steve, um, other folks who I know are out there, uh, put your questions in the chat and also disagree with me. Hey, Squirrel, I didn't do that and it worked better for me. I'm very interested in disagreement, questions, uh, comments, and thoughts. It makes a much better stream. We get much more information. I'm better off the cuff hearing things from you and reacting and disagreeing and having a, a helpful discussion. Good stuff. Right. So uh, one thing I want to mention is that... Um, uh, we're talking uh, today about what to do if you're not technical. How do you make sure that you get the right people when you are not yourself a programmer? And uh, we find it, uh, I find more and more that this is happening across all my clients, that uh, there's a, a very large population of people who know how to use technology, who know uh, how to make technology work for them, work for customers. They're industry experts. They're um, entrepreneurially minded people. 
And the biggest problem they have, the biggest thing that I'm always telling that sort of person to do differently is to ask more questions. And uh, as I say, we're gonna do a whole event on this in two weeks, but I wanted to offer something to those of you who are having trouble with that. I have an official certificate here. I had these printed just before COVID hit and I was gonna take them around physically to my clients. Then I got on screen, so I've been doing less of it. But I turned these up the other day and I wanted to offer them. This is an official certificate that gives you permission to ask questions of any technical person. It's officially stamped and certified and signed by me. Um, and you're allowed to ask things like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Can I see the results? So um, I'm gonna uh, talk to you about questions you can ask of technical candidates. That uh, certificate gives you the right to talk to anybody about any technical matter. I have your, you have my official permission to do it. Dumb questions or ones you think are dumb are actually some of the most valuable ones, as I think we all know, but don't act on enough. So if you'd like a certificate, just write to me. It's uh, ds at douglasquirrel.com. Look on squirrelsquadron.com or, or douglasquirrel.com and you'll find all my contact information. You just have to give me an address and I'm happy to send you one. Hi, Sean, excellent to see you. Good stuff. So ask me questions. Tell me why you're here. Otherwise, I'm just going to launch through my material because I have uh, plenty of stories and, and examples for you. So um, uh, let me start with one of my very first clients. Uh, it was um, a client that did machine learning and artificial intelligence and all that cool stuff about 10 years before anybody else made it a household name as it is today. And what they were doing was automatic translation first of uh, news stories from around the world. So if you wanted to know uh, the latest on um, ship ownership or you want to know who owned certain ships uh, in Bangladesh, uh, they would translate the Bangladesh ship news for you and you could go look it up. So you can think of it as like Lexus, Nexus, or Bloomberg for uh, news from around the world in many languages. So they had very sophisticated tools that managed a large volume of data before this became kind of the cool thing to do. And um, their biggest challenge was actually attracting the attention of the sort of person who knew this stuff really well. Uh, it, it's extremely difficult to hire those sorts of people today because everybody's dealing with big data. This is something we've all discovered is really useful in the TikTok era that if you know a lot about people, that by itself can be very valuable. Um, but those folks were still very hard to find. There weren't as many of them. And they were still very much in demand at that time, about 2015, this would have been. And so we needed a hiring strategy because we needed a lot more folks. There was a lot of demand, as you can imagine, for this kind of tool. And uh, we didn't know how to find them. So I'm going to start with the problem of sourcing. How do you find a, a, the kind of technical stars that you would like to attract, that you'd like to get into your funnel? for your recruitment process. Then I'm gonna talk about how to filter them and how to close them, how to get them to actually come and work for you. But I'm starting with how to find them. So this client uh, uh, really needed a, a strategy for finding uh, lots of people. And um, uh, although I'm gonna talk about recruiters in a moment, that wasn't doing enough for them. So the strategy they used was very interesting. They went to where the engineers were and I helped them to draft a uh, sort of template for messages uh, to the top 100 people who were contributing to open source. Not everyone will know what open source is. Open source is where you write code and you give it to the world. You say, here's the code, anybody can use it. There's some licensing issues and so on. But um, uh, essentially you say, I'm working on this project and I want everyone to use it. Um, the browser you're using to watch me, um, if it's Chrome or Firefox or one of those, it, uh, Safari, all of those are based on an open source project called Chromium. So that's one example. Linux or Linux is a, a, another such uh, a, a tool. Android is a third. So there are lots of these around. And if there's one in your area, in the, the, the type of um, uh, software that you need people to write, then uh, that's one good happy hunting route. So they wrote to the top 100 people contributing to this. Um, and what they did not do was have, well, we didn't have chat GPT yet, but they did not have some kind of automated template. And I bet you guys get this as well as I do. You know, I, I had three or four of them this morning. Um, you know, dear Mr. Squirrel, I'm very excited about your project and your um, website. Uh, I have a team that can help you with your um, sourcing, you know, whatever it is. Um, you'd get these kind of standard rote um, uh, messages and everyone just bins those, right? No one pays any attention to them. Um, engineers also treat the same way anything that comes from a recruiter. So really good engineers, the ones who have really great ideas, who are um, very much in demand and the kind that you want to hire. I said in the title of this, I was going to help you hire star coders. 
uh, if you want that kind of person, do not write them any kind of template. Uh, you can have something that kind of you, you fill in bits in. So you might, you know, your description of your project or your software might be similar for each one. But you do not want it to read like, uh, you know, I'm a recruiter for this and thus, and th this is exciting, and please uh, write me right now so I can get you on my list. Because those go straight in the bin as well. What you want is something that is credibly technically interesting to the person that you are writing to. And what these guys could talk about was uh, machine translation, which was um, uh, and still is today a very interesting and live area, but uh, back then was even more um, cutting edge. So they could talk about some of their machine translation challenges, the sorts of tests they were building, and so on. Now, um, you might say, that's going to be difficult for me to do at a technical level because I'm not technical. Wait a minute, Squirrel. You said you were going to help me with uh, hiring, uh, even though I am not able to talk about uh, bits and bytes and Kubernetes and, and Kafka and all the other clever tools that uh, the geeks around me keep talking about. Don't worry. That's okay. Because what you need for that and for a couple of the other steps I'm going to suggest is a technical proxy. So you need someone who can represent you and uh, provide a uh, technical view, uh, give technical answers to technical questions, um, give a technical description of what your software does, what your company does, um, that's going to be attractive to the candidates you want. So you can't escape from needing some people around you who know how to code. But those people don't have to be great recruiters. They don't have to be great managers. They don't even have to work for you. So for example, I do this for some clients of mine. People will hire me to help them with their hiring process, typically for CTOs, VPs of engineering, that kind of role. And uh, so I can help with that, but it doesn't have to be me. And if, if there are experts in your area that you might know, they might be on your board of directors, they might be elsewhere in your company. So they might be, you know, you're a new project in, in Europe and uh, there's a US uh, group that's um, uh, doing something similar and you can go to them. Uh, look for a, a technical proxy, a technical, technical advisor who can be helpful to you. And so the, the process to follow uh, my client from 2015, the process would be uh, to identify a, a whole bunch of people who are in the right category, who are the right sorts of people. Your, your technical advisor can help you with that, but uh, you may also know. And then write to each one individually. This is a costly process. This isn't cheap, but it gets you great people because they pay attention. And you write to each one about something they're doing, their open source contributions, their recent employers, their uh, blog posts, something that they are doing. And you ask them about a, a technical issue that's related to that, that's related to your company. Uh, you know, we're working on machine translation. I see that you've uh, given a really interesting talk. I walked, watched a few minutes of it. Uh, it really looks like you're um, inventing some new stuff here, particularly your use of the, uh, the BERT um, filter, uh, the, uh, sorry, the BERT model um, seems like it's uh, quite innovative. Have you found any challenges with uh, scaling it up? No, I just made that all up and I'm not a machine learning person, so I may have got the details wrong, but that's the flavor of uh, the kind of message you want to send to somebody like this. Now that's going to get you much more attract, uh, attraction interest. Uh, you're going to not be sitting in the in the bin uh, as a result of that kind of message. And uh, I think if I remember right, uh, the, the, my client got something like a 50% open rate, 50% response rate to that kind of message um, because it was uh, a personal. It was very clearly not from a computer. It wasn't a, a uh, template. It wasn't from a recruiter. It was from a real technical person who had technical skin in the game, was, was working on the kinds of projects that were important to them, and it got a conversation going. Now, some of them, of course, didn't want to leave the jobs they were in, but they were also in groups of people and they, uh, who, who might be good to talk to. They, were, uh, they had friends who were looking. Um, so it was a very good sourcing mechanism for uh, getting in with the right crowd uh, who were the right people for, for this company to hire. Um, let's see. So we have now, I can't always see who it is in LinkedIn, and I'm apologize. Um, but anonymous person at LinkedIn says, um, uh, this is similar to other specialized roles. How do you hire a good CFO, marketer, salesperson, et cetera? That's not my uh, task today. That's not what I'm talking about today. So I'm not going to cover that today, but it's a brilliant question. And I've helped a lot with uh, exactly those kinds of hires. I'll, I'll let you uh, kind of cross supply some of these. Um, certainly, for instance, for a CFO, you could go to CFO forums and groups. There are a number of them that are allied to the Squirrel Squadron that um, uh, 
that we cross promote to and do events with and so on. Um, so you might look in those sorts of areas and write to them with specialized information. Um, oh, it's Steve, of course. Hi, Steve. Um, so Steve, uh, just come on the forum and ask that question because I'd love to talk about it, but I'm not going to do it today. I just want to stick to uh, technical engineering roles. How do you get engineers, product people? How do you get the people in, that are going to be in your engineering team? But it's a great question. Ask me on the forum and I'd love to answer. Um, now, I just want to mention something else about how you get people. Uh, I've given you one idea there, one uh, mechanism for getting super people in. Um, and I, I said, uh, well, engineers don't really respond. Really great technical people don't really respond to recruiters. There's one exception to that, which is they, they do respond to recruiters they know. Now, now, then there's a chicken and egg problem, which is how do the recruiters get to be known to the engineers so that they actually open their emails if they never open emails from recruiters? Uh, and the recruiters are quite clever at that, but only the really good ones. Uh, so we have an amazing one in, in Europe, for example, in, in the London, uh, James Goodrich, uh, who uh, hires, as Steve is asking, for these kind of C-suite roles, particularly um, CTOs, VPs of engineering, heads of product. Um, and he has a database a mile long. He just knows everyone in the industry um, who, and he knows when they leave a role. And, and so he's very much on top of that. Um, and, and there are other people like James in, in every industry and in every, um, in every locality. So when you can find really great recruiters who are really, really switched on, they can get you to these kind of stars. Um, finding such people is challenging. But again, this is where a technical proxy, technical contacts that you have have that don't need to be the kind of people that will work for you, might be elsewhere in your company, might be friends or advisors or on your board, those folks are likely to know them. So, you know, I could give you a list of three or four of them uh, in Europe that I happen to have worked with. Um, I know a, a little bit less in, in other jurisdictions where I I haven't worked as closely, but I know a few. Um, and so if you ask somebody like me, uh, if you ask people who are within your industry, they may know recruiters who can do what you need. But what you really want from such a recruiter is a, a deep database. You want them to have deep knowledge of the industry, to be participating with um, engineers. You know, Some recruiters I know run events. They um, uh, run um, uh, uh, webinars and things like that that are attractive to engineers. They sponsor them. Uh, and so that's how they get those contacts. And um, uh, if, if that can be a workable method, but if they aren't bringing you amazing people, uh, and I'll talk to you about how to filter uh, and discover who's amazing uh, after this, if they aren't bringing you a lot of those, that means they haven't got a good database. It means they may have scraped the web and you know, grabbed a bunch of people off LinkedIn, um, but they, they haven't got something really deep where they have a, a, a real connection to those folks. So in that case, dump that recruiter, find another way. Okay, so um, please fire questions at me, uh, just like Steve did, uh, Manesh did, um, uh, ask me questions about how to filter, but I'm going to move on from filtering uh, to, uh, sorry, from finding to filtering. So I talked to you about how to find the right people, how do you get them into your funnel, get them sending you a, a CV or a resume and um, working with you. They're interested in, in your company now, they're interested in your role. Now, how the heck do you know if they're any good? So there's something you you uh, simply can't escape from, and, and we've already encountered it, which is only a, a, a technical person can recognize another one. Now, maybe somebody will invent a way for ChatGPT version 7 or something to give coding tests, to give um, uh, to, to assess engineers in a way that's actually credible. But there, we're a long, long way from that today. And um, I am not going to give you some magic tool. I'm sorry. I wish I had one uh, that will let you sort of uh, rub a little uh, square of, of plastic on, on somebody's forehead. And if it comes up green, that means they, they know what they're talking about. I just can't do that for you. And I'm sorry. I wish I could. Um, but there are lots of things you can do uh, to discover whether somebody who's come in, you've kind of attracted them, you've got their attention, it is somebody that can be a, a star for you. So um, I will start with something you can see on their CV, on their resume, on their LinkedIn, which is just remarkably rare. And I took a poll on the forum and I asked, hey, uh, which of the people who are coming into you, the candidates that you see, the, the CVs that cross your desk, which of them really show a deep product understanding? They, they know what the customer needs. They uh, grasp uh, how those customers are thinking. They uh, anticipate uh, what features might be valuable and which ones wouldn't. And uh, they show that to you in their interview. And um, not surprising to me at all uh, that uh, everybody said either um, not at all, they're clueless, they have no idea what customers need, or they'd have just a little bit. 
And uh, I wasn't surprised by that because that's the standard, unfortunately. Uh, and those are people who are not star uh, techies. They're not the people you want to hire. Now, there, I will say that there exist people who, who are wonderful as coders. They are uh, fantastic, um, uh, uh, academically minded uh, uh, programmers who, who do an absolutely fantastic job and do not, wouldn't know how to talk to a customer if, if one came and punched them in the face. They just have no clue how to interact with um, the real world. And, and they are living in a, a bubble where they build amazing software that looks good to them. Now, you can manage people like that. But... I'm talking to you if you're looking to build a team uh, uh, from a base where you, you aren't technical yourself and you don't have loads of, those, uh, loads of others around who can help you. So I'm assuming you are not in a position to manage somebody like that and you do not want them. And I'm here to tell you, you definitely don't. I, I'm often called in to clean up messes left behind by these um, highly brilliant, absolutely fantastic um, intellectual uh, uh, contributors who have built amazing systems that do uh, much more than customers need, don't do what customers actually do need, and uh, don't actually work. Uh, so you want to stay far away from that sort of person who does not understand customer needs. Now, how on earth do you recognize that? Because um, many engineers will simply assert, oh, yes, I'm great with customers, and uh, I know how to do this. What you look for is the stories. What you look for is the language that they use in describing their um, contributions. So uh, I'll give you two just to give you a um, uh, sort of a flavor. Uh, if I were to say, uh, as one of my accomplishments on my resume or as a, a, a summary on LinkedIn, something like that, if I were to say, uh, what I did is I optimized the, the Kafka pop pipeline so that um, we could handle 37 terabytes per minute of incoming uh, customer behavior data uh, and uh, translate that into um, a uh, event stream, uh, which is stored in a CQRS database. Um, now, I haven't told you anything that's valuable to customers. I've told you a lot of technical terms. I probably messed some of them up because I haven't worked with those technologies myself in a long time. Uh, but uh, I've told you about some pretty impressive stuff. That I've, I've uh, done a lot of amazing things, but I've told you nothing about their purpose and what value they provided. Now I'm going to give you the, the version that you want. And, and this is rare. The good news is this sticks out like a sore, th a sore thumb. You really notice that uh, somebody has this characteristic in their writing because most do not. And so the same actions, the same results might uh, sound like this. Um, I improved the quality of our um, uh, advertising um, uh, uh, spend and the responsiveness uh, of our customers by including a huge volume of uh, customer insight data from a third party. After cleaning this data and uh, storing it in an innovative way, I was able to uh, uh, answer customer uh, answer um, uh, questions from our uh, marketing team uh, 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 every single day that increased our profitability by 47%. Now, you notice how I was talking there about the effect on the team, effect on the customer, effect on the bottom line uh, of my technical contribution. It was the same technical contribution that I had in my mind, it's the same thing that I did. Now, if you can find people who are able to write something like that, who are able to share with you um, that kind of story, then you have somebody who's a diamond in the rough. You have somebody unusual. And by the way, this you would think that somebody in, say, a product management role or a quality role or a design role would, would be better at this. They're not. Um, and they give just as much technical detail. You know, I ran the scrums more effectively. Uh, you know, I uh, became a, a certified uh, a, a scrum designer or something like that. They give you a lot of process detail or a lot of um, activities that they did, but not the outcomes, not the results for the customer. Um, and, uh, of course, if you see that in their CV, then that's something you can then draw on in the interview. So one of my favorite ways when I'm helping folks with um, CTO hires, VP engineering hires, those sorts of things, one of my favorite things to do is to, to draw out those stories and get them to tell me how they dealt with a difficult customer, how they handled a um, new market that they entered. Um, and if they give me a lot of uh, technical detail, that's interesting. But what's really valuable, what really makes them stand out is that product understanding that um, uh, interaction with the customer, which sadly is so rare, even among technical executives. 
So uh, that's the first thing you can look for when you're filtering. Now, the second thing which you absolutely must do, now if you take nothing else away from this, if you don't um, uh, listen to me about anything else, if you don't believe me on any of the other points I, I have, if you don't get that certificate from me to let you ask technical, uh, technical questions of technical people, you must remember this, which is do not ever hire any programmer, anybody who claims to do a technical task without seeing them do it. That includes, by the way, product activities, design activities, quality assurance activities. You want to see them do the work themselves in front of you. Now, then you say, well, wait a minute, Squirrel. <laughs> Hang on. You just said I'm a non-technical person, and I'm supposed to be uh, interviewing these people in a technical way. This is where you need your technical proxy. Uh, and you can do this in a number of different ways. Um, for example, when I'm um, helping people with their hiring, I'll often bring in a, a subcontractor, somebody I know who's done this for many years, and I'll say, you run these tests, tell me the results. And the test has to run in a particular way. That is that uh, the person who is doing the test, the per your technical proxy, the person who's going to ask them to write a program or to design a, a new um, web application or mobile phone application or something like that, that person needs to be pairing with the candidate. Uh, there's a bad type of test which turns off um, technical people faster than you can ever believe it. Um, which is one where you say, now I'd like you to go to that whiteboard over there and I'm going to sit here with my arms crossed and say nothing. And I want you to do this highly technical activity on that whiteboard. Everybody hates these. The um, Apples, the Facebooks and so on are notorious for doing these kinds of things. They're very academic. People actually even cram for them, study for them to be able to do these algorithmic kind of tests. And their, their correlation with actually working with a team and producing the software that you need is very low. So. We're looking for the person to prove that they can do the activity and to prove that they can do it with the person giving the test. So um, I figured out once that I'd done about 1,500 of these in my career as a, a CTO, VP engineering, and so on, because uh, I did an awful lot of hiring and an awful lot of not hiring of people who failed these tests. And what I would do is sit down with them and say, we're going to write code. We're going to write it on this piece of paper. Um, but we're going to do that because I want you to use any programming language you want. I want to come back to that. Remind me, I want to talk about flexibility of language. You don't want to filter on something here, um, namely what technical skills they have today. And I wanted to see how they could learn. So I would say, look, we're going to use any language you would like, any um, tools you would like, and we're going to do it together. I'm going to be the compiler. I'm going to be the um, uh, Google for you if you want to look up questions and get answers to them. We're going to work together on this. Uh, and, and I really did work with them. I would help them and suggest things and, and work with them as if I were writing code with them on a real project. And the, val the, the value per minute was absolutely huge. You know, Some folks just absolutely um, couldn't talk. So they would have great ideas. They'd write stuff down on the paper, but they couldn't tell me about them at all. Instant fail, right? I, they can't collaborate with their other members of the team. Other folks uh, really sank when they didn't have um, some of the, the tools they were used to when they, they needed to rely on me or, or get more information. They just couldn't discover new stuff. They were fine in a narrow space that they understood and they could do a great job there. Uh, but man, they just could not get anywhere um, by themselves. And, and learning something new was really challenging for them. Um, now, I left something out when I was talking about um, finding people. I guess it fits here under filtering as well. There's a filter you don't want to apply. And that filter is, do they know the technology I'm using today? So you might be a, a machine learning shop in which people are using Python. You might be a, um, a financial um, services provider and you're, you're using certain types of databases or um, uh, uh, Reuters data or Bloomberg data or something like that. There might be particular tools that your team uses today or that you're planning to use in your software. Ignore those. Do not look for people who know those things. Now, if you have, someone happens to turn up and they're amazing on all these other characteristics and they know that stuff, extra bonus, fantastic. I mean, I'm not saying don't hire them. Uh, but what I'm saying is don't filter someone out simply because they don't know, say, the programming language of your team. Some of the very, very best hires I've ever made have been uh, engineers who did not know the programming language, but showed me that they could learn. And I gave them a book on the programming language the team was using, and they were superstars within three weeks. And I could see that learning. I could see that learning in their history, that they had done that kind of thing repeatedly on their own, learned. Um, and I could see it in the test. I could see it in my um, interactions with them, which is why it's so vital 
that your technical proxy works directly with the person. If you use the, the term pairing, they'll know what you mean. Pairing is a technology uh, tool, is a, an activity that engineers do sometimes. And um, if you say, I want you to pair with a person, don't sit back and watch them, but I want you to give them a coding task and work on it with them. The, the value per minute you'll get from that is absolutely huge. Now I see a bunch of questions coming in. I'm gonna answer those in a second. Um, but or actually I'll come to that now. So um, app dev uh, on YouTube said, hi app dev, um, uh, look at the outcome stories they have and they will tell you they have the skills to solve problems. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, um, but uh, let me sort of reiterate this and, and see if it's helpful because I, I may not be um, uh, describing it right. I may, may, uh, I may not be understanding your question. Please put it in again if I'm not. But I think what you're saying is, look at the story. Uh, what I'm saying is, look at the stories that they tell you about the product, about the customer, about the outcomes that they produced. And um, those stories will tell you that they have the skills to deal with the customer to deal with the needs that the product has, that the, the market is showing them. And that's the really rare skill. The skill to learn a new programming language, to um, produce uh, uh, amazing uh, algorithms that squeeze every minute out of, uh, every microsecond out of uh, a particular loop or, or piece of code or piece of SQL. Um, th those are skills most of those people who have those abilities will be able to learn. Also, it'll turn up in your coding test. But what I'm telling you is to watch out for the sort of person who is able to tell you the stories like I was describing, because they're very rare and their uh, value is significantly higher to you. They're, the, they're really the superstars because they're able not just to build something that's cool, not to build something that's fast or um, innovative or cutting edge and gets them an academic paper or um, a, a round of applause at a conference, but that actually has value to customers. And so many engineers don't have that. So um, uh, YouTube person, I hope I've answered your question. If not, uh, jump back in. Oh, good. Okay. So you said that was what I was. you were asking. Very pleased about that. So uh, Steve asks, um, make a lot of effort to lower the temperature. Many interview techniques actually measure the person's ability to cope with stress. Boy, is Steve right. And Steve is even longer in this industry than me. So everybody should listen to Steve. Uh, because he's 100% right, that the approach there is to, uh, that's why I emphasize that I'm working with them, right? So this is not a situation where I'm looking for you to make a mistake. If I see a mistake, we're going to discuss it. We're going to see how we deal with it. Because guess what? All everybody, everybody makes mistakes when they write code. It's impossible to write code that runs right the first time. That's why, as Steve would tell you, you have to write the tests first. Um, and um, that's a great discussion to have with somebody. How would you hit, deal with this problem? How would you catch it? How would you help someone else who made this uh, error? How would you uh, make sure that we didn't have this error and it didn't reach production? Um, so you absolutely want to help the person feel as comfortable as possible. There's some natural um, stress that comes from any interview situation. Uh, you, you can't um, deal with everything there, but um, you certainly do not want, and, and this is the, th the reason that the whiteboard version is so terrible, you send somebody to the whiteboard, you sit there with your arms crossed, you say nothing at all and give them no support. And there they are sweating. Uh, I've done these and they were horrible. I did one at Google um, and I passed it and they gave me an offer. But uh, man, I'm very glad I didn't take it given where Google has wound up over the past uh, 15 years or however long ago it was. And it was a horrible experience. It did not build my confidence that people at Google really understood what software development meant, even back in the day when, when they were actually a bit better than they are today. Um, so, uh, uh, Steve, 100% uh, behind what you're saying. Um, Julia, good old friend Julia. It's, Julia, I've seen all your comments on the forum. Thanks so much for those. Um, she says uh, she's had situations where someone is so wedded to one language it constrains choices later. That's really dangerous. And again, back to the YouTube person who was asking, um, it, you know, you're saying, uh, is this person going to show you the skills? They're going to show you the right skills such as being flexible in the way Julia says some of her people were not. And you wind up with a situation where someone has chosen a, a, perhaps an obscure language or uh, an obscure technology that's um, uh, not as well supported anymore, and you're locked into it. And the team can't learn something else. Um, the, an engineer who says, no, I don't want to learn something new is one who makes me very, very worried. I don't want that person on my team uh, for the kinds of high growth areas, um, the, the, the uh, fast moving, um, uh, cutting edge areas that I think we all want to work in. Even if I'm doing something quite 
quite um, uh, boring and mundane. You know, I had a, a client who's um, uh, uh, doing some really great stuff in human resources overseas, and they, they can do it at half the cost of, of other folks for operational reasons, not because their technology is amazing. Their technology is pretty standard. Uh, it's it's kind of boring, but they have really good engineers, um, and I was telling them to hire more folks like these uh, who can turn those cranks really effectively, who can make sure that it's done efficiently and they can learn and say, hey, wait a minute, there's a new standard that we should be using. So even if you're not doing uh, you know, self-driving cars or, or rocket ships, uh, it's really gonna benefit you if you can make sure that the people you're using have that flexibility to adopt something new when it makes sense. Great, loads more questions, this is great. Um, Shannon Smith, uh, are there any online generic tests that you'd recommend? Or is it always best to create one from scratch that's relevant to the project? Man, Shannon, if, if I knew um, uh, a, a tool that would work for everybody, I'd absolutely be telling you. Uh, the problem is that I don't think anyone has cracked um, the human element that you really need. Um, there are tools you can use. Um, now, I'm not going to remember them. If somebody puts it in the chat, I'll mention it. But there, there are online services, which are OK. Um, but they're okay for, for giving people a kind of basic set of tests to check that they're not an idiot, that they really, you know, they're not just lying on their CV about knowing a programming language or, or knowing a tool. And that's good as far as it goes. That might be an initial filter, uh, although I'm still not a big fan. It tends to turn off the really effective people because they say, look at my history. I mean, obviously, I know this. You don't need to give me this kind of basic Mickey Mouse test. Um, and those generic tests, the problem with them is not that they aren't specific to your industry, but that they don't, they don't really include the um, human element, the interaction, the learning by um, uh, working with the person directly. So um, online generic tests I have not seen uh, being very valuable. If someone finds one and says, hey, Squirrel, this really did work for me. It's really fantastic. I'd love to hear about it. But I suspect that if that's been valuable, it's because there's there's some other filtering happening further down the line. So Shannon, I wish I had better news. I, I wish I could tell you that there's a great one to use, but I think you're better finding a technical proxy, somebody who's um, knowledgeable about your industry who can come up with something appropriate. They don't have to spend weeks and weeks coming up with some perfect thing. This is something you can uh, whip up in an hour, if not less, um, and then apply to loads and loads of people on your um, uh, in your funnel. Um, but I think you're much better off coming up with something yourself and then having that personal interaction. Of course, if you're not a technical person yourself, your technical proxy is going to tell you what that interaction was like, and you're going to tune with them what's important to you. Hope that's helpful, Shannon. Ask more if, if needed. Uh, Steve said uh, he had a candidate who said he disliked test-driven development. Now, that is not a, a sentence I would say within 20 feet of Steve, um, because I think I think he might throw something at me. Um, no, he wouldn't do that. But uh, um, it, he'd been mistrained. He was so good on other aspects that we called him back, and we wound up hiring this makes loads of sense. So Steve's endorsing this idea that if there's a process, in this case, a particular way of writing code um, that someone is even opposed to and says, hey, wait, this doesn't work for me and your team uses it, don't dismiss them. Don't say this person is hopeless. They're not, uh, they're not rescuable. We can't work with them. Instead, say, what's the record of learning for this person? What's their willingness to learn? So uh, this person clearly, when Steve um, described this a bit better to them, said, well, actually, this sounds more interesting than I thought and was willing to, to express, explore it. And that's the kind of person you want who's willing to change their mind, try something new, innovate, uh, come up with new things. Uh, let's see. Julie is saying she's... Uh, uh, some of the best people, not the expert in the technology. We've just been talking about that. Fantastic. Now, there's one other thing you must promise me you will do. Do not fail to do this. And so many of my clients have failed. I have failed and, and been utterly miserable as a result. Once you've got somebody through these processes, so you've, you've gone and found them through a recruiter or through um, uh, pounding the pavement and, and giving them a good technical approach, you've um, uh, looked for product language, um, you've given them a, a really good coding test that's interactive, low temperature, learning a lot from them, uh, and then you miss this key thing, which is checking out with people who have actually worked with them what they're like, because there's a class of people who look great in the interview. And of course, this happens in any interview process, not just technical ones. But they're, the technical somehow seems to get this more because people can shine amazingly in a technical sense. Oh my God, the algorithm this person produced was so beautiful. It was just exactly what we need. I mean, it solved a problem that took us months, did it in five minutes in, in a beautiful way. 
and, and you get very excited about this person. You say, she's the right person for us. We really need her. And, and the problem is you can get blinded by that. I have. And you never find out that person's just a jerk to work with. And they've looked great in the interview, but they're actually lazy. They're um, ineffective. They get distracted by their own um, uh, wishes and desires and can't work with others. Um, you find a bunch of problems after you hire them and you really regret it. So there's a very simple way to avoid this, which is to get a proper reference. Now, what I mean by proper is um, uh, a, a, a human being who is talking to you. It could be on a screen, it could be on the phone, um, but not in writing. Uh, and this person is telling you what it's like to work with person X, with the candidate. Um, now, you, you could do that by visiting them. You could do that by seeing them at a conference. You could um, phone a friend of yours who works at the company. Um, you can have the candidate give you somebody. You might want to verify the person really does work there, but um, uh, assuming you have a good level of trust, you're probably okay. But uh, you, what you want is stories from that person, which are similar to the ones you were looking for and we talked about with the, the YouTube person. Um, uh, these kind of stories about uh, what they've done, how they interact with customers, what sol problems they solved, what they were like on the team, um, uh, uh, what learning and growth they had, and so on. And the value of doing that, um, not in writing, but at high bandwidth, is that you can have a, an interaction. Oh, tell me a bit more about that. You know, we really are uh, uh, using an awful lot of computer vision, um, and it sounds like this person did a lot with that. Were they innovative in that area? Did they make new contributions? Um, you can uh, probe and learn more and, and people feel more comfortable. Uh, you don't want to record this, by the way. You don't want people feeling worried that they're going to get in trouble. You want to hear an unvarnished truth from them. And if you do this um, re reference call well, it's, it's not horribly difficult. Uh, practice a few times, you'll get it. Um, if you can get that kind of uh, valuable reference, you will really understand how this person works in your team. You'll know how to integrate them better as well. So what sorts of things will they do well? What will they need training or coaching on? Where will they need help? Um, uh, the opposite of this, by the way, just for entertainment value, is uh, the standard in Germany, where I understand everyone gets the same reference letter. You just get a, a piece of paper and it always has exactly the same German words on it, except one word is different. And if the word says this person was excellent, it means they're terrible and don't hire them under any circumstances. If, if it says they're very excellent, then that means they're kind of OK. And if it says that they're super duper excellent and really wonderful, there's like a, a, a dictionary for this, um, <laughs> then that means they're actually good. Uh, this is the opposite of what you need. You need high bandwidth. You need lots of interaction. And if you were to get a letter like that, you want to phone the person who signed it now. Some folks, of course, are not allowed to um, interact with you. They're not allowed to answer questions. Um, then you, you might have to take a risk. But do everything you can, maybe to talk to someone who is a former colleague who's moved on from the company where they were a colleague, um, talk to somebody who um, maybe was in a different department but worked a lot with this person. Uh, look for anything you can to check what this person was actually like in the actual work environment. Because although I've been telling you a lot about getting work samples, work e examples to look at, to, to um, learn from, there's no substitute for what it's like when they actually turn up. And uh, I've had, can tell you in uh, uh, hiring um, and influencing the hiring of thousands of people, uh, I've seen everything. <laughs> I've seen all the variations uh, that you can imagine that um, mean that the person who I interviewed was not the person who turned up uh, in every way you can imagine. Uh, Steve says, uh, many companies only allow factual references, certainly. Um, you want to look for something backdoor. You want to look for a friend of yours who's there. You want to look for someone who's willing to take a phone call. You may not be able to do it. I, I agree. Um, but uh, if you possibly can, this has tremendous value. So um, spend the time, spend the effort to do it, particularly when you're a non-technical person making a technical hire. It's higher risk for you. All the technical proxies in the world, all the filtering that I'm telling you helps you. This makes it much more possible, but you really want to know um, what was it like to work with this person? What contribution did they make? Is their CV accurate? Okay, so uh, wonderful questions. Uh, you're really keeping me going on uh, on good stuff here. Please ask more, make more comments. These are these are very helpful. Disagree with me. I would love to hear that. Um, but I'm going to talk about my final area, which is uh, how do you get people to actually work for you? So once you've identified this amazing person, you've got them interested enough to take some tests from you, there's a real challenge now. Because anybody who's this good is going to have lots of offers, and some of them are going to be probably at more than you can pay, because um, almost all of us are outbid by folks like Apple and Microsoft and, and Google and people like that, and, and this sort of person will have that kind of offer, or if they don't, they know they can get it. 
and even in today's market, which is a little softer than it used to be, um, and there are more layoffs and so on from those companies, those folks are still hiring. They're still hiring the stars. Um, uh, there's no question that um, a, a highly, highly talented engineer is extremely employable and is likely to be for the next century. Um, we're just not producing enough of these kinds of stars, and, and we may never. Um, the, these kinds of people are, are rare, uh, and it's hard to train them. It's not like you can just uh, put them through a program and suddenly they come out of the, the other end of the factory. Uh, these folks are, are unique and special. I, I forgot to tell you, I do want to tell you one fun story just to illustrate um, the kind of person you can find, the kind of quality of, of person you may be looking for, because that may not be clear to you, some of you. Some of you might say, oh, engineers are all the same. They're all kind of uh, much of a muchness. Well, they're not. Um, uh, and particularly looking in unusual areas, people with different backgrounds can really benefit you. So um, one of my very favorite product management gurus, somebody that I just think of as a, 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 an expert in getting technology to, to work for customers and, and understanding them very deeply and helping tech teams to do it, started his life as a signalman on the railway. So he was standing in a booth and pulling levers so that the thing would turn from red to green, make sure the train went the right way. Then he became a manager of signalman. And um, he was on, he described, <laughs> he was on a long train journey one day and uh, he got interested in this new thing called apps. He had a new phone and he was like, oh, I wonder, could I make an app? Because we, us signalmen, we need to um, interact with other people and understand what's happening elsewhere. Maybe these apps could help us. He taught himself on the course of a three hour train journey, how to build an app. He built one that actually solved a problem for signalmen and they all began using it. <laughs> and so he became in charge of the, the uh, rail system in his country, the, the apps for um, uh, rail uh, workers in his, uh, in his country. Uh, and then uh, he moved from that, as you would, to financial services. Um, and uh, at last report, he was doing something he couldn't tell me about for um, a major social media company. So uh, that sort of person who learns very quickly and has a completely unusual background is amazingly valuable to you. So you want to look for that kind of person. And that kind of person, of course, you're com you, everybody else is competing for them. They're very popular. They're very valuable. Um, how on earth do you, uh, do you uh, close such a person? Because you're at the point where you've tested them. You're really sure. How can you make it exciting and interesting for them to come and work for you, a non-technical person? So you're not going to wow them by making them think that they will, uh, you know, invent the the latest um, uh, self-driving car algorithm that will uh, allow us all to climb in our cars without uh, having steering wheels in them. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to do that anytime soon, but you could try to impress somebody with your technical chops. Don't do that because you, you don't have them. However, what you can get them going with and what you can make very exciting for them is the opportunity to learn and your willingness to look at their background um, encourage them to learn a new thing and to try something that's very different and tell stories um, if you have them, uh, like the ones I've been telling or describe what you'd like to have happen, that you'd like to see that the team tries new initiatives, tries new things, learns quickly, um, uh, in, invents new things, and, and what that might look like for you. And that, now people will often talk about, get people excited about your mission, talk about your North Star, talk about where you're going and, and what problems you'll solve for the world. That's very helpful, but everyone does that. You know, Google will tell you they're going to organize the world's information. As far as I can tell, they're uh, mostly organizing it so they can sell you lots of ads about it, but um, uh, that, that's at least what they would talk about and the sorts of things they want to do. Facebook, I can't remember what they do, but uh, apparently they um, uh, help people share cat pictures, uh, which is very exciting. Um, so they'll all talk about some exciting mission that they have. But if you can unify that with learning and contribution and improvement for the person, then you have a very powerful combination. Um, and uh, as Steve says, autonomy, mastery, purpose, a good set of things to, to look out for. Um, the uh, um, uh, one story I will, I will tell you is about a, a person who was very inspired by both of these things um, and uh, was really, really excited about the work he was doing. Uh, this is at a client of mine uh, in San Francisco. Uh, they are curing various diseases. So they are using machine learning and um, some very sophisticated lab techniques to develop new drugs much more quickly. And you can imagine that's quite a successful, exciting thing to do in financial terms. But um, the founder didn't talk about that with um, uh, uh, the person that I was coaching for a while. He said, you know, when she hired me, she really talked more about um, the opportunity for improvement in this area and what difference it would make to people with this disease. And as it happens, 
the disease that they're working on is one that his father had died from. So he has a very personal connection to this work. The mission is very meaningful to him. And he has the opportunity to work on really exciting technology and learn about it. So uh, if you can talk in compelling terms about that, uh, and if you're here on this call, if you're interested enough to, to learn yourself, you're probably able to do that. Uh, then uh, I think you have quite a good shot against somebody who's going to pay more money, have a bigger name. Um, you're not going to win every one of those battles, but you're, you're going to have quite a good shot at uh, convincing someone that that's interesting, that's worth pursuing, um, rather than um, uh, simply going and, and chasing the money, uh, chasing the big name, uh, which uh, uh, never was very satisfying to me and isn't satisfying to the kind of person I hope you're picking up that I'm describing here, the kind of person who loves to learn, the kind of person who um, is interested in serving customers and producing a result for them. Uh, Julia says, uh, it's standard where there's a legal person is uh, we confirm this person worked for us between these dates. Exactly. If you get something like that, um, uh, put it in the recycle bin. Uh, it's really not going to help you. It doesn't give you any information and that's intentional. You need to go around to the back door. You need to find somebody who worked there, somebody who knows someone, a board member. Um, you need to find someone uh, who can tell you about this person um, I wouldn't say off the record, but certainly in a, a high bandwidth on a, on a phone call, on a Zoom call, um, is going to be able to tell you more detail than um, this kind of useless standard um, uh, uh, HR type response, because uh, it just doesn't help you. Uh, that reference is, is worthless. Okay, so um, I think I've covered all the topics I intended to, and uh, we're close to the end of time. If you have any final questions, please fire them on in the chat. Uh, we've had some really great ones uh, coming along in here, and I would love to, to hear more. Um, in the meantime, uh, we'll be following up and discussing more on the Squirrel Squadron forum. So a number of you that I've seen here I know are on that. But if you're not, or if you haven't got around to joining the Squirrel Squadron, I'm going to put that in the uh, chat and on the screen. And uh, I would love to see you at uh, future events. Like I say, in two weeks um, on all these same platforms that you're on today, um, uh, I'm going to be talking about how to um, uh, uh, ask technical questions, how to get information from your tech team. Once you've hired them, how do you work with them? So uh, we'll be doing another of those uh, in a couple of weeks. We have these discussions all the time on the forum. There'll be a follow-up with some more ideas, uh, uh, follow-up thread uh, after this. And um, uh, weekly emails uh, where I give you my latest thoughts, what I'm observing, and uh, what um, uh, news and ideas you might be able to use immediately um, and provoke you with uh, uh, so, some different ideas about uh, who to hire, how to use them, uh, where technology is going. Uh, so uh, you're uh, always welcome uh, at the Squirrel Squadron. It's always free, um, and it's my way of giving back uh, because I've learned so much from uh, hundreds of clients over uh, over many years. Uh, we have a uh, comment here. It might be Steve again. I'm not sure. Uh, one of my most memorable early career technical hires was a history graduate. Hey, I've got in one of these stories too. Did a data project with ancient documents. She would have been overlooked by most CV screeners, and she was fantastic. Detail-oriented, fast learner. This is the idea. that You've got the exact idea. I don't know who that was, but um, uh, man, that's exactly what we want to be looking for, is that kind of quick learning, interest in technology, um, and uh, the, the mechanics of what uh, engineers do, the mechanics of what a data person, a, 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 a QA person, anybody like that. Hi, Anusha, uh, that's who you are. Um, a really great uh, summary, really appreciate it. The mechanics is something that those folks can learn. But the ability to learn it, the interest in doing it, the proven value that they have provided in the past and their understanding of customers, you can't replicate that. And that's what I'd encourage you to, to filter for because you can fill in everything else. Okay, I hope this has been helpful to all of you. Uh, uh, thank you uh, to all of you for, for coming along. seeing some thanks in the chat. And um, love to see you on the Squirrel Squadron forum um, at the next event. Um, and uh, keep, uh, keep in touch and have a wonderful day. Thanks so much.